I was in Cairo, Egypt in 2009. Um, I had planned the president's visit to Cairo. I was part of the advance team. I was the press lead, so I'd done a number of different meetings with delegation. About 10 days of preparation went into the visit. It was the visit where he was going to address the Middle East. Um, and we were almost there. The plane was about to land. In these visits, what happens is you roll out, the, the host country rolls out a red carpet, they set up some sort of a welcome ceremony, you get uh, the press set in an area that they can watch the welcome, and you uh, get the, the military all lined up, basically the, the Secret Service and the military forces start controlling the area. So the trip is just about there, President is about to land, we have made this little clicker is not working. Let's see how I can get it over. We have made the preparations. You see people sweeping off the red carpet. Air Force One is landing and I go to walk forward. My job at this point is to greet the delegation and the press and show them where to go. So we're going to go under the Air Air Force One's wing. We'll record him getting off the airplane. We're going to go on to the speech site. Um, I go to walk forward. An Egyptian security guard stops me and says, no, you can't go. I have my credential. I literally had sat in chain smoking general's office so that I could get these credentials. I said, no, I have my credential. I can go. And he said, no, you can't go. And I was like, I'm part of the delegation. My job is to go meet the plane. I need to go. And finally he says again, no, you can't go. I realized this isn't working for either of us. So I walk to the back of where the press is. I walk to the other side. I walk right past the other Egyptian security guards across the red carpet to the back airplane stairs. I get my delegation and we go. This little clicker is not working, so I'll come back. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't work. Okay, so anyway, what did work is I found another route. You know, I. Um, don't take no for an answer. I'm not very good at that. <laughs> you know, when I was a little girl, I had really big dreams. I don't know if you guys have watched the movie Zootopia. <laughs> I love the movie. I have a four-year-old, so this is very much in my wheelhouse now. Um, there's a scene where uh, Judy Hopps is hopping along, and her family tells her, you know, she wants to be a police officer, a police bunny. And her family tells her, you know, Judy, you know when we got really happy? It's when we, we just settled. And then, and then we were happy. <laughs> and so, Judy, you should just settle. Settle down to your dreams. You know, I grew up in Galesburg, Illinois, and, and that's kind of what people said. We just... We're happy when we settle. You've got big dreams, that's so nice. Good luck with that. Um, I came to the University of Kansas and actually Lawrence, Kansas was the most optimistic place I'd ever lived. I loved Lawrence, Kansas. I threw myself into absolutely everything. I got involved in the sorority, in student senate. I was in the NAACP. I was in the Multicultural Resource Center. I was involved in virtually everything I could get myself involved in. I had run a voter registration drive the night Gloria Steinem was coming to campus. Um, they were inviting a few select students to go meet Gloria Steinem over this dinner. And I was very lucky to be invited. I don't know if everyone in the room knows Gloria Steinem or everyone who's watching it remotely, but I have found a lot of classes don't. So <laughs> Gloria Steinem is a leading women's right advocate. I often say I would never have gotten to where I am had Gloria Steinem not come before me. Um, I went to this dinner and I asked her, you know, I'm turning 21 tonight. It was my 21st birthday. It truly was my 21st birthday. My mom and my aunts were visiting. Would you have time to come for wine with us? And she said, you know, yeah. Can I bring my friends? And I said, yes, of course. It was amazing. So I get to go to wine with Gloria Steinem for my 21st birthday. It's a really old picture. <laughs> but um, you know, for me, it was incredible. I asked her all sorts of questions and she answered them in how she 
um, dealt with anyone you know who didn't agree with her in in what she did in her life and it was just so inspirational um, at the end of the dinner I said I, I won't I, or at the end of drinks, I said, I, I want to be Gloria Steinem. <laughs> How do I do that? <laughs> and she said, you don't want to be Gloria Steinem. You want to be Johanna Masca. You want to be the best version of yourself. When I graduated the University of Kansas, um, the best version of myself, that was still a big question. Who was Johanna Masca? I, I was trying to figure that out. I had no idea what I wanted to do. My parents um, hadn't graduated from college, but my mom's advice was get health insurance. And <laughs> my dad's advice was don't do what I did. So this is the advice I had. Uh, thankfully, I read a lot. I read, um, Pope Bronson had written a book, What Should I Do With My Life? And it, it, what I took away from it was people who were really happy had found a sense of purpose. For me, I had always loved politics. I came out to my family of Republicans as a Democrat. I often uh, joke, but truly, when I told them all that I was a Democrat and that they were all going to regret their vote, and I had a lot of opposition at the table, and I had uh, an uncle who went and had choice words with my dad afterwards saying, wow, your daughter. <laughs> I won't. I won't say what I said earlier, but that is, <laughs> it, it, it was impressive. Um, you know, I loved politics, and so I realized, well, maybe you know, that could be a sense of purpose. At the time, I was really lucky. Um, governor Sebelius <laughs> was the governor of Kansas, and I loved her, so I figured out a way I could get in touch with people in her office, and I said, I will do anything. I don't care what it is. Um, they put me in first as an intern, and I get a role doing assistant to the press secretary, I'm doing clips, I'm doing anything they need. I moved to Iowa um, actually for my husband's job. My husband and I had been dating our senior year in college. Um, we stuck together as partners after that. My husband got a job offer in Iowa. He had gotten a couple before then. It was like Missouri, and I was like, no. <laughs> they said Pennsylvania, like, no. And then they said Des Moines, Iowa, and I was like, maybe. We had some friends who had worked in Des Moines, Iowa um, for the human rights campaign, and they said, you will love Des Moines. Love Des Moines, I did. Love Iowa, I did. I went there, and I threw myself into politics. Um, I got involved in a gubernatorial campaign. Um, I actually uh, would go on to work in state government. Um, I would lose campaigns, and it was actually the best thing that happens. You know, it's, it's that quote that when you're at your bottom, how you react is kind of more important than when you're at the top. Um, I truly believe that that it, it is true. You have to get up every single day. Um, you know, when I even heard President Obama was considering running, I had watched him in 2004 give the Democratic National Convention, and I had heard him talk about my hometown, Galesburg, Illinois, and talking about Kansas values and his Kansas values of um, hard work and perseverance. I connected with him, and I wanted to see him become the next president of the United States. So I figured out who was going to move to town, who I could meet, who would have any connection to President Obama. Um, Paul Tews was going to be the state director, and he tells this story now, and he laughs. He moved down the hall from me. It was totally coincidentally. I went to a party. I met him. I said, where are you going to live? He said, 10th Street Lost. I said, that's where I live. I said, what floor? He said, fifth floor. He said, I'm going to, I said, I'm on the fifth floor. That's fantastic. So I did the very Midwestern thing of welcoming him to town every day. I would bring him baked bread. I would tell him, I want to work for this candidate. I will work for this candidate. I will do anything for this candidate. Um, he tells the story now and laughs because 
I didn't know this, but he would go, because our, our uh, apartments were on the fifth floor, and my apartment was right next to the elevator, he knew that, he would, that I would hear the ding when he got off. <laughs> so he would actually go to the fourth floor and walk across <laughs> the floor and walk up a set of stairs to go to his apartment to avoid me. Because he knew I was going to be like, I'm going to work on the campaign. And he didn't have any jobs. I mean, President Obama was considering running. So <laughs> this, this whole thing, he, you know, he always laughs. Thankfully, he eventually relented. My persistence went off, and I got a job working on the Obama campaign. He said, you're going to do press advance. I had no idea what gift he would give me. My job was setting up events. It was literally setting the stage for history. It was working with journalists to let them in, working on negotiations with foreign leaders. It was an incredible opportunity. But in Iowa, at the very beginning, when he didn't have gray hair, <laughs> it was a little different. It was not going to be a sure thing. Um, you know, in Iowa, I love, Iowans are very skeptical. So they don't necessarily see a, a candidate come to town and be like, oh, we love you. They say, oh, we're undecided. I saw it turn when President Obama started telling a story. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the story of Greenville, South Carolina, a little lady in a church hat, fired up, ready to go. But what happened was during the campaign, he had promised a local legislator, yes, I'll go to your little hometown to win your vote. And he really regretted it the morning he had to do this because it was a very long way from anywhere. He had driven a long way. He was in a bad mood, bad New York Times story, rain, just not very happy to be there. And so he would tell the story that he would go to this event. He's shaking hands with people. And a little lady in the back of the room starts yelling, fire it up, ready to go. Fired up, ready to go. And he starts looking over and going, why is she upstaging me? This is, I'm running for president. And then, you know, what's funny is he would say, you know, after a little while, though, he starts feeling kind of fired up. And he starts feeling kind of ready to go. And he says, you know, if one voice can change a room, one voice can change a state, one voice can change the nation, one voice can change the world. I truly believe that, even to this day. We went on to win Iowa. I drove 30,000 miles in Iowa in about seven months. Um, we would engage every small town in Iowa, and I was there for caucus night when uh, the president said, you will all look back and you'll know that it started here. Um, I consider myself very lucky. I went um, from the uh, campaign straight into inauguration. Um, here, let's see, I have to pass forward. This was on the campaign trail, 30,000 miles, on to inauguration and straight into the White House. I accompanied to the president to 40 countries. I would go to more without. I would go to almost every state. And I would go, and I, my vantage point was literally right in front of him with journalists so that they could capture history. Um, you know, Again, incredibly lucky, marine helicopters over, I got to see the Cairo, the pyramids in Cairo with President Obama. I got to see Gandhi's house. This is actually Martin Luther King's signature when he slept at the Gandhi house. I went to the Great Wall of China. I flew over Petra and King Abdullah's helicopters. This is actually Petra, which by the way is awesome. Go to Petra. But what I have to say is, um, the coolest thing I've ever done is have my son. So I had my son in March of 2012. My husband and I welcomed a little baby boy. Um, it was not always easy. We did not have any family in Washington, D.C. We didn't have really any help. So we would just, I would, when I first had Hugh, just cart him with me to the White House. I brought him in at three weeks. I was literally negotiating over credentialing in the delivery room, which, by the way, is an awesome trump card. So <laughs> I said, I'm going to keep this short because I'm in labor, but I'll control credentials, and I got him. <laughs> so um, I, I, it, seven weeks after I had him, I was in Afghanistan planning the live address to the nation. One year after Osama bin Laden's death, 
my husband and I would often trade off, um, you know, I would wave him into my office to sit with Hugh, or I would push Hugh over to the schedulers. Um, little Hugh became quite a frequent visitor. Here's him and my husband in the West Wing at a Easter, or not Easter, uh, Halloween. Halloween. Um, at some point I realized with my son, here's my little son, <laughs> you gotta love you. <laughs> There's you. <laughs> All is glory. You know, in some, at some point I realized this was an incredible job. I had the opportunity of a lifetime. But I was in China when I uh, found out that we were going to go to India. One of my friends was Deputy National Security Advisor. He said, you get to go to India. We're going to do Republic of India Day. We're going to go visit the Taj Mahal. You get to do, I would normally do the pre-advance. So I would go in advance and I'd look at all this. And there was no part of me that wanted to go. Um, I miss my son and more importantly my son was saying mommy I miss you and so I made a big transition um, what's interesting is you know my husband and I both made a conscious decision to step back and to move to California and have an entirely different lifestyle where we get to enjoy all those moments with our son where we get to be involved in his parents group and we love it I will say, I've said this a couple times in classes, and I think people seem to understand. We have images for how women are supposed to fit and how men are supposed to fit. And it really is, uh, it stands out to me when my husband goes to breakfast with my son, and they say, you are such a good dad. And then when I go to breakfast with my son, they're like, why can't that woman control her child? <laughs> really drives me crazy. <laughs> Worst things in the world. Anyway, having my child best thing I've ever done. I can tell you now, this is 12 years after I've graduated, and I am very proud to tell Gloria Steinem who Johanna Masca has become. And I will tell you that there were many, many times I could have given up and I could have stopped. I was so tired. I, I worked, I literally slept less than post childbirth when I was on that campaign. Post childbirth, I was again very tired. I stayed at it. That tenacity, that ability to hold on is really important. My mom, when I was moving to California, I'd made this decision to move to Los Angeles, big decision. My mom had had a book signed that I had written when I was in the fourth grade, when I was 10 years old. I hadn't seen this book in some time. A Secret Service agent had seen my mom get the president to sign it somewhere, and he's like, that is the sweetest thing that your mother did. I guess it was a surprise, and I'm like, what are, what are you talking about, Mike? <laughs> this book, in the book I say that I'm going to be the first woman president of the United States, and about 10 years later I was going to move to Hollywood and write movies, <laughs> which my mom gave me when I was on my way to move to Hollywood. I, I actually agree with Erica that it's not linear. It's kind of all over the place. And by the way, I haven't been president and I don't write movies. So there are some caveats. <laughs> but tenacity at, at its root means to hold. To hold is to hold firm, to hold firm to your beliefs, to hold firm to your dreams. And I realized that that's what I did. I sought my internal motivation, my internal sense of purpose, and I held on. I held true to what I wanted to do, and I have to say, I've gotten to live my dream. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>